Thank you so much for being here. Can you all hear me? Okay. I'd really like to thank Jared Santek for his extreme care of all of the mentees this year and for his wonderful homemade soup. I'd also like to thank the mentors who've been so giving of their time and have paid careful attention to our work, uh, especially the poetry mentors, Oliver De La Paz and Jude Nutter. I feel very blessed to participate in this program. I'm gonna read you four poems tonight. Uh, the first is about a trip that my family and I took to Disney World in January to escape the snow. I won't, that's enough. Yeah, you know what I'm thinking. Uh, this is called The Happiest Place on Earth. My son is seven, and his father and I walk with him around the man-made lake, faux sanctuary in the January warmth of Florida. The ducks swim through smooth waters, the ripples behind them crescendos of living. Our weary feet are sandaled, sandy from the white beach, our blood slowly warming. The shadows of work limp behind us in the shade of the palm trees. At home in Minnesota, the boilers belch and whir, while the white air crackles below zero. Yet here, the blue sky. The calm ducks at the Disney World Resort are almost tame, waddle almost close enough for our son's small hands. He identifies the colorful boys, the demure girls, the couples in love. Overhead, an eagle. Here is the moment, the, sli the silent swirling of nature, and I exhale deeply knowing what's to come. The rapid descent, the talons grasping, the eagle holding that iridescent head beneath clear waters. What unnatural final view the duck must have had as his lungs filled with the empty water. <laughs> oh no, my son says, marooned in his small circle in the happiest place on earth, the drowning heavy on his small shoulders. We crochet our arms for comfort as the eagle lifts the limp body beneath him. My husband speaks of the circle of life, reminds our son of my love for duck a l'orange, how the eagle probably loves duck too, and <laughs> our son, allowing himself some consolation, says in his small voice, well, it's still sad, and what about his family? <laughs> More statement than question. And so we board the bus to magic kingdoms, to smaller worlds. We ride the roller coasters and feed him ice cream in the shape of Mickey's head. We carry lidded Disney mugs for our endless American thirst. One black for dad, one pink for mom, one blue for boy. Shiny plastic paid for by shiny plastic. And it is what it is. And in the humidity and sunshine, we are moist and self-aware. My second poem is, uh, <laughs> my second poem uh, is about bunions. I figured I'd never read a poem about bunions or bunion surgery, so it might be a good challenge for myself. <laughs> And um, it's about my mother, and I just told her a couple hours ago that this was coming, so I figure it's better to ask for forgiveness instead of permission. <laughs> this is called Muscle Memory. One, like the roots of trees hugging the earth, all knots and twisting exposed, my mother's feet have turned outward. Perhaps it was the shoes, the high heels of secretaries with their early ambition to be sharp noticed, with their toes forced into abnormal spaces, birds with clipped wings in small cages. Perhaps it was heredity, genes and DNA, curling muscle and bone from within, the body's own molecular foot binding. My mother waited too long until the bone and soft tissue of bunions expanded slowly over decades, growing marbles of the body's decoupage. She waited because her own aging mother needed her to buy the groceries, to run the errands in cheap canvas shoes that yielded to the bunions' clenched fists. Gradually, a lost center of gravity. The Earth's rotation is almost audible. 
slight bells in the distance. Physical, the inner ear spins, the foot's confusion, a fluttering. There is falling over the vacuum cleaner and two broken arms. Sidewalks emerging as hazardous open spaces. So now, two. Dear Jesus, the surgeon shaves and hacks, removes a hard V, a piece of bone pie. Each foot is cleaved, plated, and pinned, reconstruction and resurrection. She is booted and wheelchaired. She is watching the young and the restless from small corners. Still, the feet hold memories in muscle. The feet ache to defy the steel and stitches. Her own mother dies while my mother is feeling elderly and trapped. After the funeral, the body lifts alone in a plain, a white arm rising above the desert. Her mother will be buried under the Kansas prairie grasses, where they both ran barefoot as children. Grief and guilt spin a strange dance, litter in the wind. And my mother waits behind a door closed against the Las Vegas sunlight. Overhead, the plains shuttle tourists, unaware of the dead mothers near suitcases stuffed with flip-flops and swimsuits. Even after the doctor says, stand and walk, my mother is hesitant to feel the earth beneath her. She will pause and listen, the depth of absence and loss so silent it almost sings. She will pause before that first step, all her weight on the desert's flatness, on her own body's twisting. Uh, the next poem is called In Avignon, which is Avignon, France. And I was very fortunate uh, to take a trip in December and January of this year with two girlfriends to Spain and southern France. And I realized it's not the same traveling in my 40s as it was traveling in my 20s with a backpack. Um, we just function a little bit differently. We're in bed by nine. Uh, and this is uh, called In Avignon, and it's a little bit I guess about being middle-aged. In Avignon. The car is too big, the wheels scraping against the narrow sidewalks, a sound like the world's trapdoor opening. The stone streets, the heavy doors of buildings, the sun clinging to the air above the rooftops. The three women hold a ring of three giant keys, special instructions for sequence and turning, the keys like weird crochet needles jabbing at the door. A small woman peers out of her own door, her gray hair and eyes fluid as if she sees through their commotion to her past. The wine, the duck in rich sauce, and the rigid mattresses force these women to move as if underwater but they travel together into strange spaces. They walk with empty arms into the city square, to the vendors selling Santas, climbing ropes, vin shod, toys that move by springs and rubber bands. They want their bodies back, such shameless desire for everything now. They are transparent opals tucked into pockets. Right here, thousands of miles, how far they've come, the old popes are dead in their crypts, yet feet still feel the uneven stones that line the insistent streets. Look, they think, just see the way the elderly couple sits, each holding a glass of wine in one hand and with the other petting the panting dog. The women feel no fatigue, no sadness, just this December day, in the bright square facing the setting sun, their old wounds closing at night like tulips. <laughs> so my last poem is titled The Referral. And um, a referral is a term used in adoption when a family who's been waiting for a child has a potential match. Uh, at that time, the adoption agency will typically call and say, we have a match for you and, and you'll get the paperwork and some photographs possibly. And then the families are asked to send that information to a doctor to get feedback and see if there's anything um, that they should know about the health of the child. 
So right now, uh, people are passing out some copies of this poem. And um, a couple of things you probably should know is that uh, some of you know my husband and I are adopting a little girl from Korea. We're very excited about that. Uh, we won't be able to get her for another year. Um, so we do have a child. This poem is not about her. It's about a first referral that we received. And uh, some of you also know that I am a teacher, so what is a reading without a little class participation, <laughs> right? So you all should have a copy of the poem, and on your copy you will have some lines that are highlighted. And when, you, when I get to that point, I'd appreciate it if you would read those lines out loud. <laughs> You'll notice that the stanza that you're looking at is run together. So if it comes out a little jumbled, that's OK, because it's meant to represent the thoughts um, and repeated questions that were going through my mind at the time that this happened. Do you all understand? <laughs> all right. The referral. The baby girl with the unsmiling face waits in Seoul for someone to say yes, yes to her wide-set eyes, her flattened philtrum, the growth of her head flatlining on the charts behind the growth of her body, lifelines moving like lovers parting. We see only those small hands, that bright face, so we dream a nursery of lavender butterflies, stare at the photos, our days opening like spring, clever, pretty, her name, our daughter. Then the doctor's report, the adoption expert. The words are burned out coals, fetal alcohol syndrome, special needs, long-term care. Somewhere, a door slams shut. We close our ears, bodies wilt like plucked flowers. For days, I circle inside myself, a maze of guilt and grief drying my body, slowing my blood. The air is thick between my fingers. We become the third in a trifecta of couples. No, no, it's too much. We aren't the right family. We're Guilt, like dust on our hands for all the days ahead. We're so sorry, and they take back the photos. She exits our lives as a cloud. Words seem silly. Language, empty shoes by the door. The house holds its breath, and the room remains beige. Poised and waiting, we repeat silently, clever, pretty, clever, pretty. You were wonderful. Thank you.